You all uh, this morning had the opportunity to meet uh, the founding director of the Baker Institute, Ambassador Derision. And uh, Ambassador Derision is again with us this evening. Uh, let me turn the podium over to uh, the Ambassador. Thank you very much, George. I've, uh, George has reported to, to me on the excellent deliberations that you've all had today, and we're looking forward for tomorrow's uh, conclave uh, to continue this uh, excellent program. I, I am so delighted in terms of the cooperation and the collaboration and the productive dialogue that takes place at the International Space Medicine Summit. So uh, I want to congratulate all of you. I have a wonderful and simple task this evening. It is to <clears throat> introduce, very briefly, a man who needs no introduction, the honorary chair of the Baker Institute, the former White House Chief of Staff twice, the former Secretary of Treasury, the former Secretary of State of the United States of America, the Honorable James A. Baker III. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you that uh, you kept that introduction short. That's the, way to, that's the way to introduce people. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to join you this evening because I think uh, this event has become a premier event in the world of space medicine. And it is most appropriate, I think, that this year's summit focus on the utilization of the International Space Station to help us understand about long-duration space flights and to help us prepare for space trips far beyond the moon. I want to begin by acknowledging the presence of some people here tonight. And first of all, I want to recognize uh, George Abbey, whom all of you know, I'm, I'm sure, uh, who's our, uh, we're very proud that George is a Baker Institute fellow. And of course, all of you know, he was a former director of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge the presence here of my doctor, the guy that takes care of me when I have nose or eye, ear, nose or throat problems, Dr. Bobby Alford, who's uh, a co-host uh, representing Baylor Medical School, which is the co-host of this event with, uh, with the Rice University's Baker uh, Institute. I also want to welcome uh, Dr. Igor Yusikov, who's director of the Biomedical Institute, Institute of Biomedical Problems, and his entire delegation from Russia. You know, the space station would not exist without the efforts of Dr. Yusikov, his institute colleagues, and their homeland. I was just having a conversation with Dr. Yusikov before I came up here. Uh, about how uh, we used to have such excellent cooperation between the United States and Russia back there in the dark ages when I was Secretary of State. Things were changing. I hope one of these days we're going to get back to that. But we've always had, as he pointed out, excellent cooperation between Russia and the United States in the area of space exploration. We're also honored to have with us Nobel laureate and particle physicist Samuel Ting, who led an international consortium that built the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And we are very pleased as well that my fellow Marine, that is United States Marine, and the administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Charlie Bolden, is with us tonight too. Semper Fi, General. And finally, welcome to all of our other international partners. Welcome to all of our other international partners from Canada, from Europe, and Japan. You have all done much to make the space station a tremendous research laboratory. Thank you all for being here this evening. I've been asked to say a word tonight about the need for international cooperation between countries uh, in an increasingly globalized landscape. So let me start with a premise. Long gone, in my view, are the days when nations and their people could isolate themselves behind barriers, whether they were natural barriers or man-made barriers, even man-made barriers, like, for instance, the Berlin Wall. 
and expect a successful way of life by isolating themselves behind barriers. I suppose the most obvious failure today of a country that attempts to do that is probably North Korea, where the government maintains a stranglehold on its citizens by shielding them from that evil outside world out there. But of course, as we all know, that is a lose-lose situation, both for North Korea and for the rest of the world. Thankfully, many walls of isolation have fallen during the past two or three decades. This phenomenon occurred slowly at first as radio waves broadcast messages of hope across national borders. But today, it is accelerating, and it is accelerating at a very rapid pace as the internet hurdles towards its goal of connecting us all. So you ask yourselves, you have to ask yourselves, what is the meaning of this new world? Uh, or as Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, would refer to it, this flat world. Well, it means that isolationism will not be a successful option in the future, that we must re remain engaged in world affairs. It means that wealth will spread to other countries as those other countries learn the advantages of capitalism and free markets, much as China, Brazil, and India are catching up because they have adopted that economic paradigm. And it also means that there will be greater opportunities for global cooperation, cooperation between countries, between businesses, and between people. That cooperation is important, of course, because most of the challenges that the world faces today are global in nature. Challenges such as finding sustainable and clean energy, combating international terrorism, addressing the loose nukes problem, and others. These problems cannot be solved by one country alone or even by a small handful of countries. They are going to require cooperation among a large cross-section of countries. That's why the International Space Station can provide more for our world than to simply serve as an excellent laboratory for the outstanding research that it does. Just as importantly, it could serve as a model for countries working together to address, to address challenges beyond the challenge of cooperating in space. Just one part of the International Space Station, Dr. Tang's Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, involved the work of more than 500 scientists from, 16, from far, sorry, 56 institutions in 16 different countries. That includes, as, interestingly enough, both Taiwan and the People's Republic of China working together. If successful, the AMS alone could justify all of the investments that have been made in the International Space Station. Yesterday was the second anniversary of the experiment's flight to the space station on Space Shuttle Endeavor. I believe Dr. Ting will share with us some of the significant scientific results that have been gained from his experiment during his talk tomorrow evening. In the meantime, the space station modules were built in different countries around the world and were assembled for the first time in space. Sixteen nations, including the United States and Russia, worked together to produce incredible and truly unique research laboratory in space. It's amazing when you think about it. You consider the evolution of space travel when it started it, since it started in, in the 1950s uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. We once worried that should the Cold War grow too hot, civilization might end, as my former boss Ronald Reagan used to say, in a f fiery hail of atoms. Today, the United States and Russia are working closely together and peacefully as partners in space notwithstanding the fact that there are other tensions in the relationship. This, of course, is a significant achievement and one that we need desperately to build upon. 
The world has changed dramatically since Sputnik first circled the globe over 55 years ago. In 1957, no one could have imagined that American astronauts would be speaking Russian and training in Star City to fly in a Russian Soyuz spacecraft to an orbiting International Space Station, the largest project of its kind in the history of mankind. Today, several other nations are planning missions and expositions beyond Earth orbit. China is even pursuing its own space station. Working further with China on the International Space Station would benefit all of the partners as well as China. With its proven capabilities, China could offer another means of human access and additional logistic support to the space station. With the success of the International Space Station under our belt, we really should explore whether the scientists and astronauts of the United States, Russia, China, and yes, other countries can work together more generally in the conquest of space. Perhaps in the foreseeable future, we can send a spaceship to the moon with representatives of several countries, not just one. Before I close, I want to add a word of caution. Yes, international cooperation is increasingly important, as I've been saying up here this, this afternoon. And yes, space exploration is one place where international cooperation very well might benefit all countries. But as the United States heads into the future, we must not forget that above all, our national interests have got to be protected when we embark upon any international adventures, just as every other country will have to focus on its national interests. On the one hand, of course, we should strive to work with other countries to develop a coordinated approach to space exploration, just as we should develop a coordinated approach, for instance, to combat terrorism. But you know, the world remains a complex and competitive place, and our decisions simply have to take that into account. Let me for a moment, if I could, use China as an example. I tend to agree with those who say that the biggest geopolitical challenge facing the United States in the near future is going to be how we respond to the emergence of China as a great power. How we in this country cope with that event will affect not only the United States, but the entire world. Can we cooperate with China? I certainly hope so. There is clearly significant scope for cooperation in the area of expanded trade, for instance, regional stability, or energy security. These are just three areas where American and Chinese interests converge. Now, sure, there are strains in the bilateral relationship. We have differences on Taiwan. We have differences on human rights. We are beginning to develop some significant differences on cybersecurity. These come immediately to mind. But I also know this, ladies and gentlemen, there is no surer way to make an enemy or to find an enemy than to go looking for one. And I don't buy for one minute that China is an enemy of the United States, just like I didn't buy at the end of the Cold War that the Soviet Union was an irre irreplaceable in enemy of the United States. So in short, I think what we need to do as China emerges is to magnify our areas of agreement through greater cooperation and manage those differences that exist in the relationship. There are always going to be differences in the relationships between nations. We need to properly manage those differences. Space exploration should be one of those areas of agreement. So as we head into the future, ladies and gentlemen, I think that we need to build on the kinds of international relationships that have the potential for cooperation. Just as we have developed relationships with other countries through the International Space Station, 
Developing cooperative efforts for further space exploration, for one thing, will allow us to save on the costs of space exploration, just as it will allow all other countries to save as well. But more importantly, it can allow us to free our imaginations and harness our ingenuity to do bigger and better things. Then perhaps we can all explore the universe together far beyond Earth's orbit and indeed far beyond the moon. Thank you all very much.